welcome to Enjoy Holistics interview series with inspirational holistic and spiritual teachers. Today we have David McCready, the author of Real Alien Worlds, Volumes 1 to 7, and The Great Simulators, Parts 1, 2, and 3, and the Astral Academy, where David is helping others connect to their higher selves using modern astral projection techniques and simply learning to breathe properly. David's great simulator books offer a fascinating perspective into physical reality and shifting our awareness and mindset to astral connect with higher guiding spirits, recognize and appreciate a special effects team uh, of lower astral beings who are providing the drama you wanted to experience but have forgotten. David's, David's experiences have taken him astrally to the higher astral worlds and beyond into non-physical, uh, beyond the human form or ego. He has also experienced other parallel worlds and human civilizations and brought back a wealth of spiritual knowledge to assist others in doing uh, the same. Uh, we will touch on many subjects today, but in the future shows, we hope to delve deeper into uh, more you know, other topics. So, David, tell me a bit about your background and how you fell into this line of work. Well, my background is one of uh, structural engineering and building contracting because uh, I was born with a very technical mindset, so quite a practical person. And running parallel to this was an interest in the invisible stuff that affects us, like how did ghosts work, uh, what were things like mediumship. So wanted to be able to do that as well. And I read about various things, and in my uh, research, I came across the whole subject of astral projection or out-of-body experiences. Uh, I discovered this more or less in the back pages of a book on hypnosis, where the hypnotist explained that uh, when he put people into a deep hypnotic state, they sometimes went out of body and met very informative guiding spirits, which could be deceased relatives or some other helpful being. And I thought, that's for me. I've got to learn how to do this. And I don't want to be doing it under deep hypnosis. I'd like to do it consciously. So once I discovered about that, I set about trying to discover how you make astral projection and out-of-body experiences work. And that's really what got me going, is that practical technical side and an interest in these otherwise invisible things. That's fascinating. So, I mean, was there something that prompted you to do it? Because, I mean, most people are sort of living in uh, an existence where they don't believe in this kind of stuff. So there must have been a catalyst for you to... Uh, to experiment or to research it? Well, I, I think actually it's better to say that most people who've got an interest in this uh, are amongst us who are pre-programmed. In other words, we get born into this world and we're always interested in it. It's like we're driven to research these subjects. So it's a bit of pre-programming that kicks in. And even if we want to ignore it, it keeps coming back and we eventually have to just go along with this pre-programming and learn this skill. <laughs> so tell me a bit about your, the great simulator books. Um, I've read the third one, which is fascinating. So I just want to understand more about the, the first three, the first two. So let's so uh, it's often suggested that the life we're living is some sort of illusion. Uh, the idea of this was taken up in that Hollywood film, The Matrix, uh, where they said in The Matrix film, the idea is that actually uh, you're asleep somewhere in a bath of what looks like warm KY jelly. Uh, with tubes down your nose, and somehow your emotional energy is being used to feed a bunch of robots. Uh, and if you do wake up on, from it, you get flushed down the toilets, and then you can live down in the sewers with a bunch of rebels who want to try and break out of this virtual world. And that was the idea of the Matrix movie. Uh, anyway, the reality that you find when you're doing out of body projection is somewhat different. Uh, what you discover is that, uh, yes, there is the human heavens out there, and really the human heavens is your natural home. Uh, coming down to this earthly world is somewhere you're choosing to visit. So you are 
really a heavenly being that's choosing to come down to the earthly level. And if you can get out of body, you can verify this reality for yourself. So this is how the great simulator books came up, uh, thinking, well, what to do, how to describe this. And, and it seemed at the time that the word great simulator seemed like the best fit in English for what could be experienced. And as the concept was developed and expanded a little bit more and more research done, it then turned out that the term simulation was even more well-placed than at first thought. You see, what we're experiencing is really an idea, a kind of notion. What would it be like if somewhere called the Earth existed and it was made to appear real? So we're experiencing a simulation of an idea. Essentially, we're experiencing an imagined notion made real and fleshed out to the extent to which you can drop into it and personally experience it. Does that make some sense? It does, so, but that, that also extends to the universe, the physical universe too, right? Not just the Earth. Yes. Yes, we, we're essentially living in our own uh, unlimited universe. So as far as you go in any direction, you will appear to find more of this simulation or reality. And that's achieved through the most wonderful mechanism that much of what we're going through is in fact a self-inventing mechanism. It might seem a bit strange at first, but everything we're experiencing here has the power to self-invent and develop itself. And that's why in many ways uh, Darwin's theory of evolution is on quite firm ground because we are in a sort of self-inventing environment, even though it's playing along to a general notion. Again, does that make some kind of sense as I describe it? Uh. it? It does. I mean, maze is an interesting topic with the astral worlds. Um, I mean, I was lucky enough to visit those uh, for a year uh, before they kind of stopped when my life got busy. And what I noticed was in the astral worlds was that they just seemed like an identical copy of the Earth plane with people going about living their own lives some people not even realizing they're dead from what I could account to and just, yeah. and it's almost like a reflection of the earth. And it makes you wonder what came first, the astral or the physical? Well, let's talk about the astral world a bit, uh, because what you're describing there are a lot of the lower level bits of the astral world, which acts as a kind of design template uh, for the physical world we're experiencing. Uh, a good example to uh, explain this is what happened to uh, a friend of mine who, who was in a young sorry, in his young days uh, he had an evil older brother situation and the evil older brother uh, one day decided to strangle younger brother choked the poor little guy and, and the poor little guy was knocked unconscious. And what he then experienced was, was hovering on the ceiling above his body and, and he could see down below, there was the evil older brother strangling the little younger brother, the poor helpless kid. And the helpless kid uh, was also wearing a bee uh, styling of jumper. Uh, he said he never really liked that bee kind of styling, his jumper, but he could see there was his little body down beneath him with a big bumblebee on the front of it. And he said rather annoyingly, even in death, he had the same bumblebee jumper uh, stuck to him uh, while he was on the ceiling. So he wasn't very pleased about that one and promptly returned back to his body down below, which fortunately at this point managed to revive. So. What you're in fact seeing in the astral world at a low level is sort of an energetic template of what you're going to physically be. It's like you're a ghost that's then come down and made itself physical. So you'll find a sort of loose copy of the earth in the astral world. But as you then go up higher out of that physical world, you find that everything looks much more like an energetic being. And this is something that's very confusing at first to astral travelers because they're looking for a bit of 
hard physicality, whereas what they encounter at higher levels is much more energy forms where one blends into another. And it's a bit confusing for them, and they often ignore it and then go back to a lower level. But indeed, when you go up to a higher astral level, you'll find that energy well. And also, if you keep looking up, you'll start to see a sort of greater consciousness, so like a big white thing, that turns out to be the one of us. So whilst there are many humans around, and we can have an interview today between two apparent humans, when you go flying up high enough into the astral world, you'll start to see that actually there's only one of us, and that one of us has somehow split itself into many different forms. What thoughts as I describe wow. this? <laughs> <laughs> so yes, I mean, that's the, the concept that people, you know, talk about the one uh, God, uh, the infinite creator, and it makes you think that, you know, some people may worry that we lose our identity or we lose our energy or we lose who we are. Um, is that true in your respect or do you think all these individual parts that, that, contain that, something, an essence? That slightly demonstrates how we can get this back to front. And what goes on is that we're assuming our human identity is the real you. Uh, but once you get uh, traveling around the astral, you start to discover that the human identity is really a borrowed component, something that was never uh, really you, and you've taken it on. Are you happy with discovering that your human identity isn't really you? Well, I mean, if, obviously there would be many identities of me if I've been here before. And why would yeah. I hold on to this one when I haven't held on to the yeah. other? There you go. So you do in fact have multiple potential identities which you can embrace. And when you look into the subject of other lifetimes, people see it as reincarnating and in that, you discover that, yeah, there are many versions of you that have been knocking around. And if you're traveling astrally, you can go and say hello to them and see what some of your other permutations are like. And if they're aware, they'll have a bit of a chat with you. If not, you just you look in on them and uh, wish that they could be a bit more interactive. <laughs> so in your book, you talk about two concepts that the, the human is primarily guided by other forces, so whether it be the, the guiding spirits or the, uh, the, the special effects team that are helping uh, build the drama that you wanted, um, and possibly other entities, and most likely most people are not in control at all. So give me an overview yeah. of a human and what they're made up of when they're experiencing life. And life. Well, well, let's start off with the big one of us, that godly light up in the heavens, or sometimes it's described as like a super consciousness. When you bump into this and look at what you really are, uh, you discover that you don't really have much personality to speak of. Um, ironically, people often conceptualize God as uh, an old beady guy uh, who's uh, rather wise and he perhaps has some sort of uh, checklist in front of him because you're going to sign off whether or not you're going to get into heaven. Um, this old wise guy concept is what people often think. Sometimes people often think it's the motherly character who's giving birth to anything, which is perhaps getting closer uh, to it. But nevertheless, when you go and look at this super consciousness energy, this godly energy, you often get the impression that it's just as valid to say that it's almost like a playful baby that wants to have fun and explore, but doesn't really have much personality of its own. So it's plugged in to this self-creation system. And in order to discover what it is, it's created this sort of astral world of potential beings that will look back at it. And these beings can self-invent. Uh, anytime they think there's some interesting permutation to try out, they invent that permutation. So at a higher level, you end up with some very bright beings we often see as angelic, we refer to as guiding spirits, that look after this curiosity of what am I and what kind of adventures could I have. 
And then as you go lower in the astral world, you'll find a special effects team of lower spirit forms who see it as their job to actually manifest that invention, to try and create some form of view that looks tangible and very compelling. And these lower spirit forms then, then give us all sorts of emotions that we consider to be our own human emotions. And this is the, the weird trick about it, that you are experiencing what a lot of relatively lower spirit forms have invented for you to experience. So I was talking earlier in a joking way about the evil older brother. Uh, evil is a kind of illusion that's created whereby uh, we can experience being nasty or unpleasant to each other. Uh, and by that means, we can experience a whole range of emotions that are not native to that one higher you, that super consciousness being. So you have these levels, this sort of super consciousness being. You then can see these guiding spirits who are very interested in uh, discovering what you really are. Uh, and they have helped with the creation of this lower level special effects team who give you so much of that human personality. And for example, that voice in your head when you're talking to yourself or thinking things through, that's an example of the special effects team in action. They provide that kind of internal dialogue that you experience. And once you go into the astral world, you can meet all of these characters. And it's like saying hello to all the special effects people on a movie set. They'll show you what they're up to and make it quite obvious that indeed you are experiencing an illusion. So I hope that gives a, a nice overview as to your wonderful question. <laughs> it does. And that, that leads me on to um, the enlightenment or the awakening. Is, is that where that you're allowing your higher self to take more control rather than these different teams? Ah, an excellent question. So what you're saying is, in the midst of all these special effects, wouldn't it be an intelligent move to see what would happen if you let more of that higher part of you take control of this and perhaps give you some free will? And let's just for a moment divert into the subject of free will. Most human uh, people think they have free will because they can do what they want. The idea is you get a thought in your head and if you act on it, that's your free will. But once you start looking from an astral level, it turns out that you probably don't have much free will at all when you're walking around on Earth because thoughts are being dropped into the human mind all the time. And if the human mind blindly just acts on whatever thought or emotion arrives, then it's not uh, free will at all. It's just reacting. It's responding. Uh, it's like this human being is no more than an automaton. And whatever idea gets dropped into its head, the human form says, that's my idea because I'm a clever person. And I'm clever and I'm going to act on my idea and do my idea. And really, it's just a uh, reaction. So that human form is not experiencing any particular free will, it's just reacting. But if it starts to bring in that higher self, that higher consciousness of what it is, that's the being that's really driving the whole show. And then there's a possibility that some free will might be manifested through a human form. So in these great simulator books, we're trying to help you wake up to this recognition and see what's going on firsthand. We're not asking you to believe this like some sort of religion. We're actually giving you the tools to go off and validate everything for yourself and hopefully make some new discoveries in the process. Well, so, well it ties in nicely with, um, you know, being in the present moment, being in the now, uh, people meditating to, to clear their mind. I mean, these are sort of age-old tools that have been around for a long, long time. Um, but you've, you've kind of added an extra piece that makes it, you know, you know makes us understand why you would do that. Because people say, oh, you need to clear your mind. Don't have such a busy mind. But you're thinking, well, they're my faults. I'm, I enjoy my faults. <laughs> <laughs> they serve me well, that kind of stuff. But when you explain it from the perspective that those faults are not necessarily your own and you're just reacting, then it makes sense to uh, try and clear the mind a bit to allow... Yeah. Own, own higher, higher yeah. Uh, if you want to 
Give yourself an example of clearing the mind. Uh, one of the exercises we describe in the book is that if you start flowing a lot of unconditional love through your human form and then channel it to the special effects team and give them a lot of love, they stop their chatter and your mind will go clear. And I have to say that this is a technique uh, that I'd heard the principle of in my early investigations and research. People talked about meditation, sit somewhere, clear your mind of all thoughts, have a quiet mind. And personally, I could never get that to work. It was impossible. There was always some chatter going on or internal dialogue. I couldn't get that to work. And it was only doing some astral work and linking up with some guiding spirit types. Uh, they showed me the technique of how you flow a lot of unconditional love through your human body. And when you then share it with that special effects team, they stop chattering. And at first, it's almost like a freaky experience to realize you're still conscious, but the chatter has gone strangely quiet. So uh, be aware, you can do that and get into that state where you're still conscious, but you're moving beyond that lower level clutter into a different sort of awareness of what's around you. Again, over to you. Okay. Thoughts. So, well, based on that, I think um, the te technique you mentioned in your, in your third book is around the breathing. And again, it's another thing you're taught in, in meditation or, you know, like in, Eastern meditation is to sit up properly, straight back, uh, breathe properly. Um, and yeah. what I read in your books, you know, you kind of, that's an important thing, very important. And I think there's something that's overlooked, I think, quite a lot in meditation. Yeah. Some people don't focus on it. So explain your method of breathing. Yeah. Well, if you'd start off with what we often see in a meditation group, there's a room full of people uh, with their hands folded, generally sitting on their stomachs. They've got themselves nicely into a slouch position, and they look like they're holding themselves on the edge of falling asleep, but not quite. <laughs> and you look around a whole room of people like that, and if you looked at them from an energetic clairvoyant perspective, you'd see that their auras weren't really that energized and often there'd be a big orange bubble of energy around their heads because they were sort of going around a sort of mental process. And we'd say there that in that condition, uh, you're using a meditation as a gateway to the astral world, but you're not energized enough to really launch off and do some form of astral projection. So we'd say, start breathing properly. And what we mean by that is sitting straight in a chair, as you mentioned. So if I swing around here, I'm sitting in a chair, but I'm sitting upright. I'm not using the back of the chair to hold me up. It's like I'm balancing on the chair. Uh, if I had better subtlety, I could sit in a sort of yoga, cross-leg position, upright, rather like one of those little Buddha statues. And what I do then is I'd start to breathe properly, and that means breathing using the diaphragm. The diaphragm is down here, and you're trying to breathe by letting the diaphragm go down, and if you're breathing out, you push the diaphragm up. So as the diaphragm goes up, you push the air out of your body, and as the diaphragm lowers, you're pulling the air into your body. And that's a natural way to breathe. This is how babies breathe shortly after they've been born. And then the adults get round to teaching them how to be too anxious and not breathe properly at all. And you end up doing all the breathing in your chest. So to breathe properly, you say lift your chest and breathe using your diaphragm. And that gets the air coming into your body. And seeing as the air is a living entity, it's quite useful to breathe it in. And the irony is, even though we're talking about this, we could actually be breathing better right now. So just try right now breathing a little bit better using your diaphragm. and just enjoy breathing through. And the next thing about proper breathing is doing it with more of a smile. So the idea is to smile more as you work and breathe in a happy way. And if someone's doing this at home, you might want to replay this recording and practice breathing so that you feel happy. 
I mean, people spend a lot of money on expensive drugs and opioids in order to feel happy, but it turns out you can actually feel happy by breathing better. Smokers have half figured this out. They take a cigarette and they take a really deep breath, which, if anything, helps them flow better. So just think about it right now. You could breathe better without smoking. You could just take slower, deeper breaths and enjoy breathing. And your brain can respond to this by releasing chemicals into your bloodstream that give you a sensation of general well-being. And particularly at the time this recording was made, we're just at the start of the coronavirus outbreak. One of the great ways to protect yourself against illness is to feel happier and breathe well. So instead of fearing a coronavirus or any other colds and flu, you could breathe in a happier state and enjoy being present. So the next stage about breathing well is also to do it in a rather more flowing way. You're not in a little isolation bubble. You're, in fact, part of a greater system. This is why we talk about guiding spirits, special effects, same other forms around. You're part of a greater system. And you're also, very importantly, part of an earthly world. So we would like you to breathe through connecting to nature all around you. Breathe through and connect into nature. Nearly everyone who's uh, sharing and today is recording will enjoy connecting with nature. And just realize how when you connect with nature, you are part of that energy system. We're all interlocked. It's an overlapping system. So breathe through nicely, sharing with nature, and smiling more. And as you do this, you'll physically feel your whole body tingling more, your whole body will get more energized because you're becoming energetically aware. And enjoy the feeling of becoming energetically aware. Some people doing this will be mostly energetically aware around the top part of their body, uh, which suggests that your legs are half paralyzed at this moment. So you could let that presence of what you are just flow down into your body down your legs, towards the end of your toes, or towards the end of your fingers. And I'm sure as you're doing this now, there's just a general sense of well-being as you're breathing in an energetically aware state, being more present in your human form. It's like your whole aura would go bigger. I mentioned before, if you're looking at a meditation group who'd been snapped out of their slump position, and we're starting to breathe better, you'd see that their whole bodies have a sort of big white aura all around them. And you'd also see like a column of white light coming in through their heads. And helping with that column of white light, you might also start to see some guiding spirits helping flow this bright energy down through their bodies. And right now, if you're listening to this uh, recording, one of the things you can do is breathe happily and start to sense what's going on above the top of your head. Now, as soon as I mention that, half the people who do this will tense their breathing and use their minds too much. So kindly relax your breathing again. Come back into that more relaxed state, feeling happier. And when you're feeling happier, just gradually allow the impression of a sort of bright presence above your head just to come down into your mind. You might think you're half imagining it. Perhaps you are. It doesn't matter. Just allow that sense of brightness to come into your body and with it more of an unconditional love because you are naturally a being of unconditional love. And in this situation, what we're doing is we're actually returning you to your default settings, to your natural state of unconditional love and inner happiness. And feel how you can breathe it through, breathing through that living air, sharing the energies with nature, and getting a sense that actually you're a higher being that's having fun being a human form. How's all of this feeling for you in as we practice this today? What's it like? It feels really nice. I feel very relaxed. Um, I'm not thinking anything. I was just, I was completely um, immersed in what you were saying. And 
an amazing way to describe it. And um, it, it, you know, well, as I said earlier, with meditation, you can get caught up in it thinking this is boring. Why am I doing this? Uh, people can find no end of excuses to just not do it for even 10 seconds. Um, so without realizing the benefits and realizing what's really going on under the surface, um, this really adds value. Yeah. So um, I really hope people get value out of this and just re-listen again afterwards. Maybe listen every day yeah. until you got it. I would recommend yeah. to people, if you replay this section of the recording, and perhaps do it a few times, you'll get better results with each attempt and you'll feel yourself to be in a nicer energetic flow. Yeah. And what will also happen, as you repeat it a few times, you will get the impression that there are some nice guiding spirits around you trying to say hello in a kind of telepathic way. And if you send a little bit of a hello feeling back out to them, you'll often feel it echo back. It's like they see you as like a little kid on the parent's double bed, hiding under a duvet. And the little kid can't see the parents, but the parents can see where the little kid is wriggling around under the duvet. They know you're there and they can help make more of a connect with you because you're not alone. You're never alone. They're watching you having the most amazing virtual reality experience where you often think you're a human being, but in fact, you're not. You're really a visitor playing at being a human body. <laughs> and that's so much about what the great simulator books are about, yeah. trying to help awaken you mm. and get you to see the reality of what's going on so you can have more fun while you're here, make more of an adventure of the life you're in. So what I'd like to do, uh, David, is I'd love to have interviews with you again. We'll go into the topics uh, more deeply. So we'll choose a topic and uh, delve right into them. Um, but right now, as we come up to the end of this show, um, let people know about where they can buy your, your books and how they can contact you. Mm -hmm. Well, the easy way to find me is go to my website, which is called greatsimulator.com. G-R-E-A-T-S-I-M-U-L-A-T-O-R dot com. And on that, uh, you'll find uh, a contact for me. You'll also find some handy training DVDs. Uh, and uh, We're putting uh, the various books up there to make them available to you. Uh, you can also find the books if you want on things like Amazon. And if you prefer to get them in like a digital format like Kindle, uh, you'll find it all up there. So you'll find the great simulator books which explain what's happening to you, give you some ways of validating everything for yourself and teach you a lot of astral projection skills. Uh, and, uh, we also have the book called Real Alien Worlds, which is all about what happens when you've learned your astral skills, amazing places you can go and visit. We've got a snapshot of them. Uh, but it takes the better part of 500 pages to describe all these many sh snapshots. It's like giving a little phone directory of locations you can go to, like a holiday brochure, I suppose. Uh, and we've got these books which are there to help you do it. And when you connect with them, you will find that it improves your higher connect. And at the same time, your team of guiding spirits will be able to get more contact with you and start to drop a few extra ideas into your head. So do read them. You're gonna find these books are very interactive and show you new stuff that's Excellent. not even in the text. <laughs> well, I look forward to reading that one, absolutely. And, uh, and I would love to visit those worlds too. So uh, you've got my uh, interest peaked. Well, <laughs> It's been fascinating talking to you, David, today, and I absolutely want to do this again. So um, we'll say goodbye now, and we'll catch up again next time. Thank you. Okay. And thanks for being there, Ian. It's been a pleasure. Bye-bye. You're welcome.